Okay, here we are again. God bless you. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus, have mercy. So I've switched the channel. Hope this will help more um, in Jesus' name. Yeah, all right. So thank you again. Uh, I apologize for the uh, disconnections that we're having here this morning. I don't know what the issue is. Went all day yesterday, knock on wood, without any uh, interruptions. And um, looks like I've lost the ones that were on there. I hope you come back. So I think sometimes, and again, I don't want to make everything about the enemy for sure, but I think sometimes stuff that's worth doing and stuff that's worth saying, your adversary doesn't want you to say it or he doesn't want you to hear it. So everything I said just got deleted, but uh, that's okay. I was talking about the importance of prayer. I was talking about how important it is that you learn to have a daily life of coming to the Lord, and that if you take 15 minutes a day and uh, start there, you can do that, and get up in the morning, and get up just a little bit early, and get yourself showered and coffeeed and all of that, and then find a place to pray. I was talking about praying in your, your prayer closet. And <clears throat> Jesus said, pray in the secret place. Psalm 91 said, <clears throat> he that dwells in the secret place will abide in the shadow. It's the secret that leads uh, to the, the, you know, the open. It's the private that leads to the public. And the Lord said, do that. And uh, he's going to bless it. Amen. So this is Words of Encouragement, day 446. And I'm your host, Jim Moore. And we're going to be talking about the four pillars of salvation. And if by chance we lose connection, as we did a moment ago, uh, we're going to keep on keeping on. Amen? Because I am going to make sure these words get out one way or the other, even if my adversary doesn't like it. Amen. All right, so the four pillars of salvation. Now, I start out by saying I had a very powerful encounter with the Lord this morning over some of these issues, and it felt like he was talking to me about some pretty important stuff this morning. And, you know, most of the time when the Lord speaks to me, I feel like, or he speaks to me about what to uh, share with you, I feel like he's talking to me too. It always helps me as well. You know, no matter how often or how many years you serve the Lord, there's always benefit by going back to foundations. Foundations, pillars, roots, these all speak of beginnings. These all speak of what you need to establish yourself or for the Lord is working in you to establish you in the things of the kingdom. Any house that is being built has to have a good foundation. Jesus emphatically declared that if we didn't build our house on the rock, when the storm came, not if, but when the storm comes, it will blow our house down. And how many people don't take that very seriously, disregard that instruction of the Lord, and the storms do come, as they always will for every human being, and it destroys their house because it was not built upon what Jesus said was in word. So rather than go into that, I just, I'm trying to illustrate the fact that he is building something. The Lord is building something in you. He's building something in me. He's building something globally in your church in your city. The Lord says that he is building us together to be a holy temple. So not just a building, but a house of God, a household of God. Our gatherings, our temples, <clears throat> our, <clears throat> excuse me, our, <clears throat> wow, oh, really? <laughs> our churches, Okay, our, um, like even the tent, the tabernacle in the wilderness, they were all meant to point to the eventuality of what God is building. Somebody said, well, <clears throat> in heaven, there's no, there's no temple, there's no church. That's actually not true. Hi, Heather. Thanks for coming back. <laughs> so um, in heaven, there actually is uh, a sanctuary and temple and so on. In the very end, it says that that is done away with. But for a period of time, it talks about the altar. It talks about the Ark of the Covenant. It, you know, there is still, God is painting a picture of the ultimate house of God, temple of God, church of God, 
tent of God, of David, tabernacle, all these phrases that all are different ways of basically saying the same thing. What is the end result? The end result is a city that acts as a temple <clears throat> full of individuals who are the temple of the Holy Ghost. So it says you're a living stone that's being fit together in the building that God is building, all right? And then one day that will be completely accomplished and we will be living stones representing, when we say a house, we tend to think of the building and that's, there's a, that's nothing wrong with that, but it's really about the household of God. If I came and said, let me show you my, my home, my house, and I walked into it, a building and nobody was there and it was cobwebs, no. It's a living house made up of living people who love the Lord and serve Him. So I said all that to say pillars are extremely important. Okay, Pillars hold things up. Foundations hold things up. Root system, we're to be rooted and grounded in love. So all of these speak of connection. Connecting, when you think of a pillar, what is it doing? It's connecting one thing to another. When you think of a foundation, it's doing the same thing. It's connecting the building to something more solid, all right? We have to be connected to the Lord himself. And this is the idea of Christianity, is that we are not just connected to a system of rights and wrongs. Although God is supremely, he is the supreme, you know, uh, author or, or um how would I say it? The, you know, I mean, he is the one that gets to say what's right or wrong. He does. And so we want to be connected, not just to a system of right and wrongs, but to himself, his, his person. And so this is why in Christianity, he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone answers, I will come into them. Because this grounding that we have, this pillar system that we have, this connectivity between heaven and earth is a person not just a system, okay? We have lots of systems, and, they're, and most of them are really good. There are some of them that, you know, people tend to look at the things that we do as Christians, and they, you know, usually in the beginning, hi, Debbie, God bless you. Hi, Angie, God bless you again. Thanks for coming back, guys. <clears throat> usually in the beginning of our Christianity, we're really, you know, on fire to do things like baptism and communion and laying on hands and all these basic things. Uh, but as you tend to get older, sometimes you get a little more cynical and people disappoint you. And, you know, it's like, I've seen that. Okay, I've seen that. You kind of start having a, a better vision for maybe some a little bit of hypocrisy stuff or whatever. And don't make the mistake of, of demonizing or diminishing some of these things that we do uh, and start calling them religious. Okay, because there is the, the primary issue of religion is not what you're doing. It's, how, it's why you're doing it. I could take communion as some kind of an act. I'm just taking bread and taking juice and I'm, or, or prayer for that matter, or study of the Bible, or anything can be done with, with the motivation of just going through the motions. That's when it becomes religion. Most people, if you ask them, hey, you talk about, let's not be religious, define what being religious means. And they have no answer because they know it sounds right, but they haven't really thought it through. So, so anyway, I said all that to say, the things that connect us to the Lord are good and they're important. And uh, the things that we do as believers, we witness, we you know, preach, teach, we sing songs, whatever, fill in the blank. They're all good. But remember that the primary pillar is connectivity to him. The point of those things, you get what I'm saying, is not to just check the box off and go, I've done that. Oh, I prayed today. I took my 15 minutes, my hour, my two hours. I prayed today. Oh, read my Bible. Oh shared a scripture, you know, it's not to check the box off. Although sometimes you do have to just be disciplined because you won't feel like it. You know, it's like, you know, eating every day and taking a shower and brushing your teeth and going to work and petting the dog. I mean, you know, it's good to do it even if you don't feel like it. But it, the purpose of those things is like a pillar. Think of the picture of a pillar to connect heaven to it. It is about connectivity and so on and so on. So I'm going to talk about four pillars this morning. Super foundational things. I know you probably already got these things. You probably already know these things, but it is really good to get them established in your heart because we are moving into increasingly difficult times and increasing times of blessing 
and the outpouring of God's Spirit. Both, the, both of them happening at the same time. We need to make sure we're in a position not to be taken out by the environment that we live in. Most people that get taken out by these things is because honestly, they didn't really look at them and think about, okay, how am I going to be ready for the days in which I live? <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> but God's grace is sufficient, right? No matter what you're facing. All right. So let's look at these four pillars real quick. Number one. So I've got loved, saved, called, and anointed, all right? Now again, I know you know all these at some level, but let's talk about them anyway. Loved, saved, called, and anointed. I probably won't get through all the scriptures, but they're all written down. Elizabeth, God bless you, sister. Nice to have you. Praying, praying, praying. All right, number one, loved. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8 through 10, but God demonstrated or demonstrates his love for us in while we were still sinners. I'm not going to get my soapbox about sinners, you know, because you hear this stuff that comes through the church, and, and I get it. It always sounds so wise and smart and everything, but the Bible says we're sinners, okay? So let's not, let's not just go, oh, that's offensive. I don't want to say that. Stop. Just stop, okay? I'm a sinner. You're a sinner, okay? I'm no longer a sinner, God, because I'm saved by grace, right? And now he doesn't see me through that lens. Okay, that's not my identity, all right? I am a saint of God according to the Bible, not according to my opinion of myself per se, okay? But that's what he calls you and I. All right, so, but the idea here is to be rooted and grounded in love. Pillar number one, that you are loved before you are saved. While you were in your filth, and degradation, okay? Now, please don't look at yourself and say, well, I was a prostitute, I was a thief, I was a murderer, and that God couldn't, that doesn't possibly apply to me. No, yes, it does. Paul was a murderer. Moses was a murderer, okay? Peter, who knows what he was? He was a fisherman. They were a rough crowd, rowdy crowd. So you get what I'm saying. While we were sinners, not after we got saved, God says, ooh, I really love you now. No, his love has not changed for you. It was his love that provoked you to come to him in the first place, okay? So you have to understand, if he loved you when you were rotten and you were in your filth, you know, sur surely he loves you now when you're stumbling towards him, making mistakes, but your gaze is fixed on him. You get what I'm saying? Your gaze is fixed on him, and you say, I will not be turned around. I don't care if I fall a hundred thousand times. I am going to serve the Lord. I know that's my destiny. I know he loves me, and that's why he created me. I don't understand everything. I'm not even going to try. I don't know why this happened to me and that, and blah, blah, blah. I don't even care. All I know is that I'm loved, and he that has begun a good work in me is going to take me all the way to heaven. Do you get that? That is so important. That is the most important pillar in your life. Until that gets established in your heart, and that doesn't mean you won't have to wrestle. You'll have to wrestle with that probably your whole life because the enemy isn't going to go, oh, what a bummer. She's got it. He's got it. I guess I'll leave him alone. No, he's going to keep coming back and saying, you're not loved. If God loved you, this would happen. Why isn't God doing this? Blah, blah, blah. Same thing he said to Adam and Eve. We have to learn that. All right. That's pillar number one. You're loved then. You're still loved now. <clears throat> oh, I just have to read this. It says, for if when we were his enemy, if when we were enemies with God, we were reconciled through the death of his son, how much more now that we're reconciled will we be saved by his life? That's just fantastic. All right, number two, pillar number two. You are saved. Okay, so again, wait a minute. I, I thought I shouldn't say be number one. No, no. Shouldn't say be number one. No, it's number two. Number one is that you were loved. If you weren't loved, you wouldn't be saved. Do you get that? I'm going to keep hammering away on this. If you weren't loved, you wouldn't be saved. Saved is not number one. Well, that's when everything began. No, it actually did not. It began when God said, I love her. I love him. I'm going to pursue them. You see, we think we pursued him and got saved. He said, no. I, he initiated the pursuit. You talk about the divine romance. You think of a man and a woman, the guy pursues the gal or the gal pursues the guy and they're going after, you know, one is going after the other and they win their heart. 
God is the initiator of this heavenly romance, of this love relationship. He's the one that started the ball rolling, not you. Okay, and he says so much of that exact thing in the scripture. I'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so this is why it says you're saved in the verse I'm using today. And again, there are many verses for each one of these. I just, I don't have time or room to put more than just one. But Philippians 1, 6, listen to this very closely. This applies to you. There was a time, I don't do much anymore just because I've fallen out of the habit of doing it. But there was a time in my literal open physical Bible, which I still like, I would go to a scripture like this, and it says, he that does this and this to you, when I saw the word you, I would like make a line and an arrow off into the margin, I would write my name, James R. Moore. This is you. This is not your church or the planet, or this is you. And yes, it does apply to everybody, but this is you. You need to see he's talking to you. This is not just some old guy writing, writing stuff on a tablet and then, you know, a million years later we have it in the book. No, this is the words of the living God who still speaks these words into your spirit today. Hi, I can't see all those names, but bless you. So listen to what the Holy Ghost through the writer is saying to you right now. Being confident of this very thing, that he, that is God, who has begun, who, who started it? He did it. He who has begun a good work, that's the work of salvation, in you is faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, a lot of scriptures we could use about pillar number two being saved, but the reason I chose this one, or I believe the Holy Spirit told me to choose this one, is because you need to understand this salvation thing is not something that God just did when you came down to the altar, and every day you got to get re-saved. No. It's fine to recommit your life to the Lord every day. That's great. That's awesome. But you need to understand you didn't pay for your own salvation. You didn't, you didn't make the initial covenant. You came into agreement with it, but it is Jesus. Listen, listen, listen to me very closely. You either pay for your salvation or he does. It can't be both. He either paid for you to be saved or you're doing it as you go. It cannot be both. And we know what the Bible says about that. It says we are saved by faith through grace, not by works least any person should boast. It is him that paid. He paid the price through the cross. If you can save yourself, now the Bible says we work out our salvation, right? That just means we're, we're walking with God and we're working out what's good and bad and right and wrong and pretty and ugly. I mean, we, yes, for sure. But he, if, if you can save yourself, then his cross was in vain. You must understand the price, the cost, what it cost for you to have your sins wiped away and have Jesus live inside of you and you to be reconnected with your created purpose, your destiny from creation, that cost was him. That was his blood. Don't try to pay for that yourself. You're not saved by what you do, okay? You're saved by what he did. But, but your relationship with him certainly depends on what you do, okay? It's like the marriage that you have with your spouse. You come together and you have the big wedding ceremony and you say, I do, and you kiss the bride or the groom and, and yay, we're now married. Actually, you're really not married in the technical sense. You made a covenant, you made an agreement, you made a promise, you said yes, okay? But then you spend the rest of your life to become one. You, anybody who's married knows that as soon as they get married, two people don't become one. I illustrate like two trains on the same track you know, coming together at 100 miles an hour and on the wedding days when they collide and they blow up and do a million pieces and then you spend the rest of your life taking two trains and making them into one. That's what marriage is. And that's what your marriage relationship, as it were, if you want to call it that, with the bridegroom, because he says you're a bride and you're a bridegroom, that's what your relationship is. The day you got saved was just your wedding day. That was just the day you said yes. That was the day you said, I will do it. And then you go down into the water grave and you symbolize your old man dying. And then you come up and you say, okay, let's two of us become one. That's the working out your salvation. But he was the one who paid for it. And he that began that process, it is saying in Philippians 1, 6, he will complete it. Can I just say this real quick and then we'll go on to number three. I know I'm talking fast. <clears throat> he 
is more committed to you than you are committed to him. He will always be more committed to you than you are to him. He is more committed to your salvation than you are. He is more committed to your eternity in heaven than you are. You cannot outlove him. You can't love him more than he loves you. You cannot out commit him. You cannot out determine having to, you can't, you can't. He's your biggest advocate. He wants it more than you do. Okay, so he will complete it to the day of Christ Jesus. Now I'm not talking about the fact, you, I mean, I don't even want to get into eternal security, okay, because that's another show. All right, so you're loved, pillar number one, you are saved, pillar number two, by his blood, number three, you are called. Now, you are not saved just to do something for God. Hate to burst your bubble. Lots of people preached it. It's not true. God didn't save you because he just needs you to work for him. Frankly, God doesn't need anybody to do anything for him in the most stringent technical sense. The Lord, the God who, you know, made the heavens and the earth, you know, who has all authority and all power, could wipe out every demon with a blink of his eye, you know, could create a whole new race of human. He could do anything that you could imagine he can do. He doesn't need, in the sense of the word need, you. Okay? Now, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm saying that as the foundation for you're called, because you are called, and you do have a work to do, and it is extremely important that you do it. But not because... He can't find anyone else to do it. Or you, you get what I'm saying. You get what I'm saying. You are not saved primarily to labor. You are saved first and foremost to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. That is the first commandment. Jesus said so. I've settled. Uh, I'm not going to argue with that. Jesus says, I made you because at the end of this thing, I want you to love me like I love you. Period. The end. That's it. Now, in the context of that, it says the first and great commandment, because they asked the Lord, what's the most important thing? And he said, well, I'm going to tell you what it is. The first and great is that you love the Lord. He says, and then there's a second. In other words, the second comes right under it, but it's also connected to it. Love your neighbor. Why? Because you can't really hate human beings. You can't love God without loving people, period. Now, I know you've been through something nobody else has been through, and so you've got all of these excuses, but it's just, I, it doesn't matter. It's just not true. You cannot love God. Without, Jesus said this, says, if you cannot love God or those whom you have seen, actually it was not Jesus, it was the Holy Spirit through the Apostle John. If you cannot love those whom you have seen, how can you love God whom you have not seen? The Lord connected loving him and loving people together for a reason. The challenges that you face loving those who love you and loving those who are your enemies, like we talked about yesterday, the challenge of doing that is that it actually helps you love Jesus more. Okay? It's easy to love a God who never does anything wrong. Actually, even then, it's not always easy because you think he does things wrong. You think that maybe he should be doing things better and you would do things better if you were God. <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm not trying to be sarcastic. Okay, so you are called or something, you're saved because he loves you, you're called because he loves you and because he wants you to get the benefit of that calling as well as other people getting the benefit of the calling. Each one of these pillars I could spend the whole day on, I can't do it. I just want you to see that the scripture says so and you can meditate on them. So John chapter 15 verse 16, Jesus said this. And again, these are Jesus's words. He said, you... <clears throat> You know, something I'm, I'm just seeing here that I didn't really recognize in my haste of putting these things together this morning. Each one of these puts God as the initiator, not you. Yeah. Each one of them, go back and look at them. Each one of them puts God as the one who starts the process. He's the one who initiates love. He loved you before he loved him. You know, he, uh, he saved you, you know, it's, you know, so on. And this, as far as your calling, same thing. See what it says. He says, you have not chosen me. Can I just say this real quick? Anytime you see something in the Bible like this that just does not, that does not compute. I chose the Lord. I remember, blah, blah, blah. Just stop. 
and say, now, wait a minute. Okay, even though I don't get it, even though I haven't experienced it, even though I don't understand it, whatever, I believe what you said. Show me how it's true. I'm just, that's just a little nugget to throw in there. Because we do. You know what we do often when we hit a place that, we, that doesn't seem to match with our thinking or our experiences? We just skip over it. I'm encouraging you as a maturing bride of Christ, don't just skip over those things that you don't like or don't agree with or haven't experienced or not sure you even understand. Don't just skip over them. Take the time to ask the Lord, how is this true? Okay, and I think it goes right along with the verses that we looked at before. You did not chose me, but I chose you. Okay, I think that's true in my life. I know it's true. He was pursuing me. He was wooing me. He was the hound dog of heaven that would not leave me alone. And I'm so thankful for it. And he even allowed me to suffer some consequences of my own behavior. And I'm so grateful he did now. You're gonna spend eternity in heaven. Thank you, God, that you did not just let me go on in my rebellious ways. The Bible says rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Thank you, Jesus, that you didn't just let me go on in my, my abject bitterness and disappointment and hatred and, and lust and addiction and whatever. Thank you that you arrested me. Is there anybody out there that say, thank you that you arrested me, Jesus? Thank you, Constable Jesus, that you arrested me and you put me in a place and you helped me to see how much you love me and how much I was ruining and destroying my life and my destiny. Amen, you're gonna thank him all in heaven. So he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Amen, thank you, Deb. Chose you and appointed you. Okay, here's the, the calling. So pillar number three, you're called. So you're loved, you're saved, you're called. You are called. Again, if you don't believe this, you won't do it. It always comes back to what you believe. That's why I said it's important to look at these pillars again, not just so that you can have the head knowledge of them. Oh, I know that verse, I can quote that verse, but that you actually believe it, okay? I actually believe I'm called. Not my husband, not my wife, not my pastor. I am called. Because if you don't believe that you are called, okay? This happens a lot with wives. And because the, and I don't wanna think of the calling as just the ministry, but that's my world, okay? Oftentimes, because I've fraternized with lots of ministers, oftentimes the wife is just kinda of in the background, the shadow, she's supportive role to the husband, and that's great. And then there's the opposites too. You, I know a number of, Lady ministers, I love you all to pieces. I think you're doing a great work. Yeah, 100% in, in, into that. But often I've seen this with the woman and the man's a minister and, the, and she's the, uh, the wife is just kind of in the background. Listen, you have a calling. Know your calling. Do your calling. If you're not doing your calling, it's very likely you don't know your calling. And if you don't know what it is you're called to do, okay, then you probably won't do it. Or... Like I'm saying, if you don't fully, really, uh, of a truth, it's easy to deceive ourselves, isn't it? But of a truth, believe, wait a minute, light comes on, revelation, I have a calling. Why am I not doing my calling, Lord? What is my calling? Okay, <clears throat> And it can be a, just a support role, or I shouldn't say just, I don't like that word. It can be motherhood. It can be working at the job. It can be fill in the blanks, okay? It can... You do this, you do, whatever. But just know that what you're doing is not just biding your time. It is a calling of the Lord. Okay, understand what it is and, and go for it is all I'm saying. Okay, because you have one. It doesn't matter if you're male or female, young, old, rich, poor, whatever. All right. You did not cho choose me, but I chose you. Jesus is talking and appointed you. That's your call. That you should go and bear fruit. Now he's talking to the disciples pretty easy to see how they were called, right? They were, they left their fishing nets, they, they traveled with Jesus, he sent them out two by two, blah, blah, blah. It's easy to see that. Every one of us have a go and, and a call, to go out and do what? Go, for you might mean simply getting out of your head space, getting out of a life that is consumed with you. Okay, it's about me, it's about my food, it's about my health, it's about my weight, it's about my job, it's about my kids, it's about my husband, it's about my wife. I keep, I, I'm leaning towards the girls' side, I don't know why, today. Okay, I don't mean to, because this, 
we tend to live in a life where, I mean, we come out of the womb screaming, it's all about me, pay attention, do what I need, meet my needs. And that's right, that's the way God created it to be. But eventually, life is supposed to transform into he that would be the greatest among you must be what? The most self-centered? The guy that gets the most blessing? The gal that goes to as many church services as possible and gets blessed more than anybody else and falls and shakes? No, 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 no. He that would be greatest among you has to learn how to be a servant. Jesus said, I didn't come to, to be served, but to serve. Okay, he led the way in that example. So, said that you should go. That's the go part. <clears throat> I'm, I'm seeing that in a very broad interpretation, of course. Some of you, it's actually called to go geographically. Leave your house, your family, your brothers and sisters, and go on a missionary, you know, be a missionary to Africa, whatever. Some of you are actually called to, to physically do that. But in the larger sense, all of us are called to go from this, this lifestyle and this mindset and this position of everything's about me to serving, to find the joy of serving others. And in doing so, Jesus said, when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. We're serving the Lord. We're walking. He's serving them. We're in fellowship with him and so on. All right. That you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Okay, so he says, I want you to go, you have a calling, I want you to do your calling, okay, and to be able to do it in a way that it actually bears fruit, and because sometimes fruit can look like, you know, well, we had 5,000 people come to the meeting, okay, I'm going to meet Billy Graham one day, so I want to be careful how I say this, but Billy himself said, only 2 or 3% of the people that, and this this is an old statistic, you can probably find it on the internet, <clears throat> where he said, I think it was two to three, maybe 5%, I don't know. Small percentage of the people that come to our crusades actually live for God over three to five years or something like that. And that's not his fault. But God is supremely concerned that our fruit is eternal, not just temporary. I know we put a lot of emphasis on just doing nice things for people so they'll know that Jesus loves them. And that is true. And that can have an eternal consequence. But just keep in mind, the Lord is supremely concerned about the eternal well-being of human beings, not just the temporal well-being. All right, so uh, I got to go to the last one. So you're loved, okay? Before you're saved, then you are saved, okay? And he's going to complete the work. Number three, you are called, okay? That's not the primary thing, but it's certainly right there with, you know, love the Lord and then love people. You have a calling, okay? And then number four, very important, you are anointed. And anointed in this context means you're anointed to do what you're called to do. Lots of times people say, well, I was a baker, so I'm going to be a baker for Jesus. Yay, great. I was a this, so I was a musician, so I'm going to be a musician for Jesus. Maybe, maybe, but not always. You know, in the natural, Paul would have been the apostle to the Jews. He was a Pharisee, okay? He had the law memorized. I mean, this guy had influence and naturally, right? I'm a motorcycle rider. God's going to use me to preach to motorcycle riders. I mean, pro yeah, probably. And Paul did affect the Jews. He wound up talking a lot of it. But he was actually the apostle to the Gentiles. And then Peter, who was more like a Gentile, a rough and tumble fisherman, okay, was actually the apostle to the Jews, okay? So all I'm saying <clears throat> is your calling may not look like what you think it is, but you are always anointed to do the thing God calls you to do. Now, why is this important? Because sometimes your brain will tell you you cannot do the thing that you're called to do, that you feel impressed to do. You say, I'm not equipped, okay? Well, you can, first of all, you can get equipped, but... Remember the saying, I love this saying, I believe it's true, in most cases, not every time, but in most cases, okay, if you are a sailboat, I'm using a lot of random illustrations, if you are a sailboat owner, you're not automatically, says God says, sell your sailboat, because I don't want, I'm going to use you to be a, you know, a worm, a worm digger, I, I, these are really random, I don't know where these come from. Okay, so it's not automatic, so don't, don't go there, because he may want to exactly use you as that. You know, we, he does want to use us in whatever current thing we're in, but he may want to change it too, is all I'm saying. But whatever you are called to do, 
you're, you're going to be qualified to do. Here's the saying, God does not always call the qualified. He doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. He doesn't necessarily call the qualified, but he qualifies those who he calls. You get that? Most people don't pop out of the womb thinking they're gonna be a missionary. But somewhere along the line, they get a call to do that. Maybe I'm talking to somebody right now, okay? Or, you know, God may call you to be a gunsmith, or he might call you, you know, I mean, we're all called to love people, most of us are going to have a family of some sort, and, and we're called to love them. Those are really, really, I think he's talking about more than that. He, when he's talking to his disciples, he's not talking and saying, you're going to go out and get married and have a family. All these, most of these guys already had all that. Okay? He's not talking about just the basic fundamentals of the society and the nuclear family and all that. <clears throat> he's talking about like an, a job description, like a vocation, like an activity, like a ministry, whatever. And he, that calling, he says, he's going he's gonna to gift you. He's going to anoint you for that. Now, let me read the last verse, and then I'm going to jump off here. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 6 and 7. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God that works all in all. Notice that double phrase, all, and then he says it again, all. God works all, all the things that he gives, in all people is what it says. So think of this as your, about your call, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to, here's another all-inclusive word, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. This is a every person, all people passage. He gifts all people. He calls all people and gives them a gift and gives them the ability to use that gift for the benefit of others. Can you see how this gets you out of the self-centered mode? It gets you into the, uh, I'm, I'm serving others and so on, and so doing serving Christ. So he says he gives this gift to all people so that all people may benefit from one another. So, quick review. Here's the four pillars. And I gave some other scriptures at the bottom of the page if you wanna look up about being the temple and living stones and what we are becoming and so on. The passage, it says that we're becoming kings and priests. Here is, let's review four pillars. Number one, you're loved. I know you know that, but it's good to know again. You are loved before you're saved. Salvation is not number one. Love is number one. It is because you're loved that you were saved. Not the other way around, okay? <clears throat> Number two, you're saved. And God has cut the covenant with you through the blood of his son, and he that has begun a good work will keep it, keep you until that day. He's gonna perfect it. He is not just the author of your salvation, he's the finisher of it, okay? In partnership with you, you're walking together. Number three, you have a calling. Don't let the devil talk you out of it no matter what. You have a calling. If it takes you 100 years, figure out what it is, okay? Ask him more. And then number four, once you realize that calling, he'll try to talk you out of it. Remember that he, that God calls, he equips, he anoints, he gifts, and he will enable you to do it through his power. Somebody says, well, God won't ask you to do anything you can't do. Baloney. God won't ask you to do the impossible. Yes, he will. Why? So that you won't be able to do it without it. And all these things are the pillars of faith, They're the pillars of salvation of the Christian life. And I hope this has blessed you today because you are called to live in this generation with all the crazy confusion, all darkness is increasing. People are gonna get more and more desperate. That is a good thing because you are going to be there to help them find the answer to the vacancy of their soul. That is Jesus. They have a God-shaped hole, amen? And you're gonna help them find it. So love you guys, God bless you. Let me pray, let's all pray right now, okay? Can we do that? Oopsie daisy. <laughs> I did that because I have my cord here and it was uh, under my arm and I knocked it over. I apologize. I'm trying to get things right. Father, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. God, thank you for your people. Thank you for what you're doing in our hearts and lives. Jesus, have your way with us today, we pray. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. As stated before, 
I am not going to be able to do tomorrow's program. Uh, tomorrow is Friday. I apologize. Uh, something's come up. I, I'm sorry. Not going to be able to be here, but thank you. If uh, you are really wanting to hear a message, go back and listen to another one. If you haven't listened to day 444, which is just two days ago, please listen to that. Please, please, please listen to that. It's about things God is doing right now in the Willamette Valley, and you're going to need to hear it. Not pick something else. But again, my apologies. Won't be able to be here tomorrow, but I will see you again Monday morning, Lord willing. And Jesus doesn't come in the clouds. So God bless you. Love you. And as always, give yourself permission to have a great day. Bye.